Hello and welcome, uh, everybody. Hello and welcome. It's uh, the inaugural live broadcast here at The Breach. Uh, we're in the beautiful The Breach studios down in Montreal, Quebec. Uh, I'm Rob Rousseau. I'm here with Martin Lukacs. He's uh, an editor at The Breach. He's the author of The Trudeau Formula. And we're going to break down this debate we just watched. We just watched a lot of, uh, a lot of debating. And it's very, it's late at night, it's past my bedtime actually, so we're going to, hopefully there's going to be some good, good content for everybody. Martin, how's it going? It's going well, Rob. What did you make of that? That was a lot of, that was a lot of talking there we just witnessed. Did, we, did, you, see any, did you see anything substantive there um, um, in that debate? I mean, a lot of the conversation seemed to focus on like the downstream symptoms of the crises we face, you know, housing unaffordability, uh, lack of clean water on reserves. Um, the deteriorating life standards for seniors, but there was so little to me about the root causes of those crises, you know? So little mention of colonialism, um, economic and racial inequalities, um, the neoliberal progressive government we've been under, Justin Trudeau, and you know, the, how the private market housing has just been overheated by speculation. Yeah, I mean, talking about the way that our <laughs> economic system contributes to all these, these uh, crises probably would be helpful uh, these kind of debates, and the, you're right that it was pretty short on that. Um, what stood out to you uh, from any, any like standout moments there? Um, for me, debate? for me, the probably the highlight like line was um, from Jagmeet Singh, who said, "How can you trust a prime minister that takes a knee one day and takes Indigenous kids to court the next?" That to me really summed up the you know, performative progressivism, hypocrisy, and status quo centrism at the heart of liberal politics. Yeah, I mean, certainly <laughs> Trudeau is not someone that has a ton of credibility um, on these kinds of things when he, as he has such a bad record at actually, uh, you know, with going through a concrete action to actually resolve a lot of these crises. Um, but Trudeau really pushed back on that too, didn't he, that line uh, about the, the indigenous kids in court. But like, what, what was that all about? Because that is, that is indeed something that, that is going on. No, I mean, like, it doesn't it, really have a real it, answer it, to that. It was truly a shameless, bald-faced lie yeah. um, that, that people like Cindy, Cindy Blackstock were immediately on on Twitter, thankfully correcting the record on the numerous times that um, the Trudeau government has taken kids to court, challenged the Human Rights Tribunal ruling against the Liberal government repeatedly. Um, Pam Palmer is going to be on in a few minutes talking, I'm sure, about I'm her sure Pam's going to have a lot to say about <laughs> this. Yeah, I, I um, don't doubt it. So... What I, one of the things I was also really struck by was um, uh, Aaron O'Toole kind of making a beeline for the center again. Yes, like he, he, we talked about this the other day. Yeah, yeah, he really, to me, reminded me of like Justin Trudeau circa 2015. Um, yeah. He was talking about you know, stuff that sounded completely atypical for a conservative, talking about principled human rights approach on the international stage, talking about fair, fair trade deals for workers, um, talking about embracing the carbon, carbon price. Um, you know, he made lots of uh, pretty vapid statements about reconciliation towards indigenous peoples. And it was really funny to see Justin Trudeau repurpose the line that Jagmeet Singh has been using against him, namely, uh, you know, you're all just pretty words and no action, and actually redeploying it against Aaron O'Toole. Yeah. Yeah, no, but it's interesting. Um, this whole play to the center that O'Toole is doing right now, it's, it's just so hard to take any of that seriously. Um, it is, but I think, I mean, from what we can see in the polls, I think, it's, I think it's been working. Like, their momentum since we last spoke on Friday has slowed down, um, yeah. and it seems quite, they seem to have evened out in the polls. But, um, but they, yeah, like, um, they, he, it, it seems to be working, and... and and the person we saw on the debate stage was very different than, um, than the Stephen Harper, I think, that most people are used to. Um, yeah. And certainly Aaron Shear. Sorry, um, Andrew Shear. Yeah. So I think, uh, and he kept pretty, he kept pretty muted and, and quiet today. He really wasn't, he was not really that big a presence on the stage. Yeah. I am kind of wondering, like, how the, like, the basic conservative constituency is going to react to that kind of attack to the center, though, because I think there's a lot of people in the conservative movement that are actually not on board with a lot of these, uh, a lot of these kind of goals that he's proposing. Um, and it, yeah, like we said, it's just, it's, uh, the Conservative Party just in general just really does, there's a real lack of credibility um, with, with all, a lot of this stuff, particularly, you know, Indigenous reconciliation. Um, and, you know, it's, that's the, this kind of alarming thing about this election is that uh, for all these things that he's talking about, um, given all the various crises that we're facing right now, 
Um, Trudeau has now put us in the situation where they very well might be taking over the government. And regardless of this, this kind of like uh, attitude that he's putting on this affect of this kind of folksy centrism, um, you know, again, it's, I don't think the conservative movement is really like has the answers that's going to get us out of any of these crises. No. Not that anyone else on the debate stage had a ton of answers for these crises either, though. No, no, the, fair. the reality is their agenda is one of belligerent militarism, um, kowtowing to the U.S. empire, and, you know, pushing through as many pipelines as possible, more even than Justin Trudeau. I mean, they, they're talking about reviving a total zombie pipeline, the Northern Gateway, which has been defeated politically for almost 10 years now. Yeah. So that's what we'll get if... Uh, it's a, a conservative government, no doubt. Yeah. Um, they spend a lot of time talking about the climate uh, during this debate. Obviously, it's something that a lot of people are really concerned about. Um, indeed. Um, I, yeah, I found it, it, it's clear both from the debate and just the liberals' like meltdown on Twitter this week uh, <laughs> that the liberals are very worried about uh, their tarnished climate record. Yeah. Um, Trudeau in the debate kept talking about how all these experts, uh, <laughs> you know, say their policy is the best. What's interesting is, to my knowledge, there's been a single expert, uh, economist Mark Jackard, who wrote an op-ed um, that said that the Liberals' policy was the best. And Justin Trudeau has been desperately waving around this op-ed all week, saying. Mark Jacker gave us eight points out of ten. Yeah, he and gave he, them an F. And he, he gave them an F. F. He gave the MVP yeah. a two. Exactly. Um, what's funny is when you look at this report, um, and Seth Klein wrote a great analysis of it in uh, the National Observer this morning, um, it is completely ideologically confused. Um, Mark Jacker gave the Conservatives a higher ranking than the Greens and the NDP. Um, so that gives you a small right. sense of like what um, his sense of proportion and analysis is. Basically, he's a someone who believes only in market policies, okay. uh, which the Trudeau government is big on, all kinds of half measures and market incentives. Um, and he believes that any kind of government action of which the NDP are proposing, including regulations and huge public investment in renewable energy, that counts for nothing. So that's why he ended up giving them an 8 out of 10, and they've been running around the country talking about uh, how they have the top climate plan. Sure. It's absolutely baseless. Yeah. Well, okay, so this is one of the reasons I'm, I'm thankful I get to talk to you right now, Martin, because I know you're, you're kind of the Trudeau guy. You know, you literally <laughs> wrote the book on, the book on this. Um, and it's interesting because, uh, you know, obviously it's, it's a six-year record now of kind of failed promises for Trudeau when it comes to the climate, a lot of talk and very little action. But if you listen to Justin Trudeau tonight, apparently it's completely different than that. Uh, and that they are, in fact, on pace to hit these targets, that they, these ambitious targets that they've set. Uh, he's talked about the, the apparently experts that you mentioned <laughs> that, were, that were apparently really, really uh, supportive of their climate policies. But, like, w can you break some of that stuff down for me? Because that's what I don't, I, like, it felt a little like gaslighting to me, or like, uh, if you can use that word, um, where Trudeau is kind of making this claim that, you know, he's, uh, they are going to hit these emissions targets, and they are actually on pace to, to exceed these emissions targets. Like, can you get a little into the, the weeds of where Trudeau actually is, like the actual reality of Trudeau's climate policies versus the, the, the you know, sunny version that he's presenting yeah. on the debate stage tonight? Yeah, no doubt. I think he was trying to invite Canadians into this, like, parallel liberal la-la land um, <laughs> where we are going to meet our targets. I mean, one of his favorite lines, which he used today and he used in the last debate, was, it's not going to happen overnight, but it is going to happen, which yeah. to me is tantamount to saying it's not happening right now. Yes. Um, it might happen in the future. Um, it's a total climate cop-out. I mean, if you look at their record, um, they are the only country in the G7 whose emissions have risen since... Uh, yeah, which was brought up many times. Yeah, which, which I was actually totally surprised and pleasantly surprised to see mainstream anchors on stage yeah. actually bring that up. So, so, you know, and he was actually asked the question, why have Canada's emissions risen? And he had no answer. Uh, but the real answer is that the Trudeau government is in a deep clutch embrace with the oil barons. Um, the tar sands and the oil and gas industry is the source of the fastest and largest growing emissions in the country. And the Trudeau government ultimately has played footsie with them. They have not actually um, said no to them ever. They've given them bucketfuls of money. In 2020 uh, alone, they gave uh, public subsidies 
uh, to the tune of $18 billion to the oil and gas industry. Um, yeah. as, as the breach reported earlier this year, they, during the pandemic, they struck up a private secret committee with the oil executives of the country basically to look after their interests. So, um, so long as Trudeau is not willing to say no more to the oil industry, um, emissions are going to continue to rise. Yeah, and I guess when we start talking about these emissions targets uh, and, and you know, the getting in this kind of contest between the different parties about whose targets are better, this is the kind of thing I get concerned about because we're talking about 30 years now of these kind of different climate summits and different agreements and targets that have been set that we've just sailed past each and every time. Uh, and that's the kind of really alarming thing as we're heading into this really serious crisis. We're all seeing the really very real world effects uh, you know, in Canada and all over the world. Um, and we're still kind of having this argument. We're meant to, you know, we're supposed to believe our political leaders like Justin Trudeau when they claim to be serious about hitting these targets, when there's just now decades of evidence that across party lines, bipartisan, uh, these targets are never really respected or hit in any way. Um, that's been the really frustrating thing about the last six years. It was frustrating on the debate stage tonight. Um, I think we're going to go now to uh, the breach correspondent, Pam Palmiter. Uh, writer and activist and lawyer. Um, do we have Pam? I'm on. Yes. Can you hear me? I'm becoming an AirPod guy. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Uh, Pam, do you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Can you hear me okay? Testing. I'm not hearing Pam, folks. Hello. Do you want to talk about that though, Martin? While we're, while we're waiting for Pam, like, sure. what, for what, like, why would we believe Trudeau now when he's mentioning this about these emissions targets um, when we've got such a long history of sailing past these targets and not not coming close to hitting them? No, no. It, it, as it was pointed out on stage today. Pick up the call on, on Skype. Keep going, Martin. Yeah, go ahead, Martin. Um, yeah, there's, there's really no reason to believe it when you look at the actual uh, carbon inventory from the, from the federal government itself. Um, uh, that said, I also, like, I was, I was woefully underwhelmed by, uh, by the NDP leader on stage when he was speaking about climate change. Um, it, they, there is this utterly foolish uh, need to defer to the Alberta NDP on Jagmeet Singh's part and continue to not offer a principled and practical opposition to the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Um, and he was pointedly asked on stage about his uh, constant evasions on this question. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, Aaron O'Toole uh, had even worse an answer, obviously. I mean, he, he's basically Re, re, modified and kind of like created a kind of like a 2.0 version of Ezra Levant's line about uh, ethical oil. His new line now is friendly oil. Friendly oil. Yeah. Very, yeah, <laughs> lovely. Um, yeah. But apart from that, um, you know, he's taking country, the country back to Harper's targets um, and, uh, and not offering much, much beyond that. So, yeah. Um, Sadly, to my mind, like Jugmeet, apart from Blanchet to some extent, was not really challenged effectively on, on his climate record. No, that's the really frustrating thing when you've got Jugmeet Singh and the NDP and the Green Party on the stage. They should, I feel like, be providing a really like a significant counter to what Trudeau is offering. And you know, we've talked about some of the ambitious stuff that's in the NDP climate plan. Um, but I just get the sense, I, you know, it's just frustrating watching these political leaders have these conversations when we see the scale of crisis that's happening um, and just feeling like the, the actual plan doesn't really meet this level of crisis, the seriousness of these policies that are being proposed. He's talking about retrofitting homes. You know, he's, he's talking about a number of important things that should have been done probably 20, 30 years ago. Um, and the very kind of serious, more radical solutions are being left on the, like, off the table. And like you pointed out, the sort of economic reasons for a lot of these issues existing in the first place are not really being mentioned on the debate stage. Well, what's frustrating to me also is like there are really admirable parts of the climate plan that the NDP has, but Jagmeet wasn't bringing them up. Um, you know, they're talking now about a, a, a climate civilian core, right? That comes from the Green New Deal in the States, and it's a plan to put thousands and thousands of young people back to work uh, in the remediation of the environment and, um, you know, 
you know, natural rest restoration. Um, it's a really powerful, I think, um, plan that speaks to the unemployment and uh, poverty that many young people live in. Uh, he didn't even mention it. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, they also talk about, um, you know, uh, supporting community-owned uh, renewable energy projects. That, to me, is a really promising demand, uh, part of the platform that we didn't hear him talk about. Um, he is talk there, there's, there's, there's talk of a national, nationalized, like, telecoms service, you know? To me, it was interesting, some of the um, criticism that was out there about the NDP plan was that nationalized telecoms have no place in a climate plan. But I think as actually we have to contract consumption and localize our economies, having accessible or even free uh, digital services and yeah. internet across the country is fundamentally a climate plan. Yeah, and it's again the really frustrating thing, we, we keep talking about this every time this comes up. Um, obviously because of these pipeline projects in Alberta and, and BC, it makes it difficult for Chinese to kind of have these conversations. And um, he just, he, he was asked very directly about this contradiction. And I'm sorry, but it's just really difficult to, uh, to watch him kind of squirm his way out of these questions and not just give a direct answer about maybe, you know, the idea of just canceling these projects, just getting out of these projects. Um, he's, as you pointed out the last, uh, the last time we spoke, He's giving this kind of, uh, saying this kind of thing where, oh, you know, I've always opposed these things, but, you know, if I elect the Prime Minister, then we're going to study it some more. And it's just the easiest thing in the world to just say that you're going to cancel no. these projects. And um, he, just, he can't bring himself to do it. No, it was, it was really disappointing. Um, I, I'm curious also to talk about the fact that, like, some of the, some of the, the policies that I wanted to hear about, we didn't hear about until the very end. So Jagmeet brought up taxing the rich to pay for expanded and new public services, but he didn't do it until an hour and 40 minutes into the debate. So, um, you know, one of the things that, to my mind, um, I want to hear more wh about was probably one of the better elements in the NDP platform, which is taxing the wealthy. Um, you know, we... As you pointed out before, this is very, very popular, so popular. amongst all, a lot of people in this country. No, and I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit disappointing to, like, when Jagmeet, Jagmeet brought it up early on, you know, but when he says he wants to tax the ultra-rich, it, it often sounds to me like he's mouthing a talking point rather than speaking from deep conviction. I mean, half of Canadians in this country are on the brink of insolvency. Meanwhile, billionaires have added $75 billion extra to their wealth. Yeah, I mean, um, you'd think that would be something that could come up more in this debate. This, this whole last 18 months has been a massive upward transfer of wealth. Um, it's, it's really, you know, it's, it's indefensible. Yeah. Uh, you'd think that would, again, that would be something that could become up as part of these conversations. No, and I, and I, and I really want to see Jagmeet channeling some class hatred and actually connecting with people's righteous anger about the totally obscene state of affairs in this country. Yeah, but, there's a lot of anger to go around, and I, just, I, I appreciate the idea of love and courage. It's a nice thought, but people are very angry. As we've seen from some of the protests outside of Trudeau's uh, uh, speeches, a lot of people are very angry for what I would say are the wrong reasons, but there's also a lot of people that are really angry for very real, real reasons, very righteous reasons. And he, should, he can and should be tapping into that kind of thing. No, and I think, I think you know, the Trudeau government's like temporary COVID supports and previously their kind of half measures haven't really addressed the discontent, anger, and inequality in this country. And I think what that has meant is that it's created an opening for the right wing to seize on that you know, discontent and channel it in the wrong direction. Can't channel it towards either scapegoats like immigrants, racialized peoples, indigenous peoples, or now in some cases towards totally conspiratorial, anti-vax conspiracy theories. And the shift that we're seeing and popularity, at least in the polls right now, for the People's Party of Canada, I think is a reflection of that. That a lot of that anger is not really being spoken to by uh, a kind of working class socialist politics from the NDP. Yeah. Um, another reason that I think young people especially, but you know, people across the country are really angry about um, is the housing crisis as well, which got a lot of time during this debate. They were able to speak about it a lot. But... Again, it was, it was a very short on solutions. We hear Trudeau talking about all the progress that's been made, supposedly, 
while the other candidates were very rightfully pointing out that you know housing prices have skyrocketed under Trudeau, that crisis has only gotten worse. We're seeing tent encampments being like brutally disrupted by police violence in Toronto and all over the country. Um, is like it feels like there's still no real answers being given for this uh, for this crisis either from either Trudeau or really anyone. Even the, even though I think you know, the NDP has some ideas that they're putting forward. Again, it's a case of not really going anywhere near far enough where where it needs to be. No, and the question we heard from from Rosie um, presented, you know, just the total like unhinged. Um, like explosion and speculative investment as uh, as a problem, as an entitlement potentially for the NDP, um, and yeah, the, the question was the question and the discussion was was totally skewed. Yeah. Yeah. So do we have Pam now? We got okay. Okay. Hi, Pam. Pam, are you with me? I am. Hey, welcome. For a while, listening to you guys. Yes, welcome. Well, it's live broadcasting, Pam. Sometimes this kind of stuff happens. Uh, yeah, welcome, welcome, though. Thanks for thanks for joining, thanks us, for joining here. us here. No, of course. I mean, there's a lot to talk about. And there sure you know, is. One yes. Of the points that you guys are making was really important. What is, what are your, what's your immediate takeaway from this debate, Pam? Um, there, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of words being thrown around, like we were talking about, uh, short on on actual substance. I feel a lot of the time. What's your immediate takeaway from tonight? Well, tonight was a little bit more impassioned by some of the leaders. But again, it just seemed like speaking points without the details. And even when they were pushed, okay, but we were actually talking about X. What's your response to that? They would just go back to their talking points. It was, it's like that frustrating thing in the media when you try to ask a politician a question and all they can say is what's written on the paper in front of them instead of actually responding. I mean, um, I, and I found the most frustrating person of all was um, Anna Mae Paul from the Green Party. All of her responses was something about her, something about her life, something a anecdotes yeah. from her. Yeah. A lot of experience. anecdotes. Like yeah. Nothing <laughs> on actual substance. It's such a far cry from what the Green Party used to be, and and you know how uh, Elizabeth May participated previously. It was just really hollow and disappointing, and she almost seemed like disimpassionate, like. This wasn't even really interesting for her. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, obviously, obviously, there was a big, a big chunk of this chunk debate, debate that was devoted, that was devoted to, to uh, reconciliation, reconciliation and indigenous, indigenous issues. issues. It's been, it's a, been a, as, we as we talked, talked about the last, last time we spoke, it's been a, a major source of conversation, conversation in our media yeah, yeah, and in our culture, yeah, culture over the last, the last couple of months. Couple although, as we also pointed out, it has kind of left the headlines a little bit from where it was a few weeks ago. What was your reaction to the different leaders weighing in on this and the different plans they're putting forward to um, walk this path of reconciliation with indigenous communities. Well, it's certainly not encouraging. <laughs> that's for sure. I, and I think they wouldn't even had to have responded to pointed and difficult questions on indigenous issues had APTN Melissa not been there asking these very pointed questions. Because as we saw in the French language debate, you know, they're talking about like burning of books instead of like the massive crisis in this country around genocide, kids in care, over incarceration, you know, all, all of these things like, you know, systemic racism, uh, the breach of our rights, the ongoing oppression. They would prefer to talk about what I call like headline issues. Let's talk about water. You know, let, let's talk about individual incidents instead of like this massive issue that they need to address. So I, I found most of the answers disappointing. I mean, Trudeau was much better tonight than he was the last time, at least getting in some content about, well, here's what we have done, and we know what the conservatives will do if, if they get in. They won't do any of those things. Uh, what's, what's really problematic is none of them really said, here's what's in our platform, here's what we're promising to do, and here's how it's actually going to make a difference. Not just, oh, we have all these things planned. Okay, but how does that relate to actually making a difference on the ground? 
when will you have all these water advisories done? When will you implement all of the calls to action for murdered and missing? When will you decarcerate native people from prison? Like the very specifics of it. And, and I just found it disappointing. And this was an opportunity for the NDP to differentiate itself from what the conservatives don't even have planned. What the Trudeau has promised but hasn't delivered on. They could have really stepped up here and talked about their platform. Instead, he wasted all of his time just attacking Trudeau and didn't give us any substance. So there's he doesn't present an option to conservative or or liberal, and that's really disappointing. And I'm sure Indigenous peoples were disappointed in this as well. Yeah, I yeah, imagine I so. so. Um, and, and speaking specifically about this this issue, issue of the of the, the ongoing, ongoing crisis of discovering, crisis these, discovering these mass graves, graves outside of residential, of residential schools. schools. Um, again, um, it was again, just it was something, that, something was that was very short, short on, substance on substance when it actually get into the, the dialogue, dialogue with the different parties. With the different parties. Um, you know, it's, you know it's, I think the frustrating, think frustrating thing when I hear about these, these conversations take place, place when you're talking about these minor, minor sort of, sort of uh, uh, band-aids, band like, like raising, like lowering, lowering the flags to half mast and stuff without really getting at like any actual concrete solutions to provide justice for these communities. Because as has been pointed out to me a couple times when I've when I've tried to engage with indigenous folks about this issue, and as as much as, as our much leaders sometimes frame, frame this stuff, this stuff as, as, as these these mistakes, mistakes that, happened that happened years and years and years in the past, past decades in the past, past. past. Um, this um, is an this ongoing situation. situation. Um, yeah. the, as we've yeah. pointed out many yeah. times, the last residential yeah. school closed in 1996, and, and a lot of the people that were involved in this school program, from the in, involved in the state, the RCMP, the people that worked in these schools, people that committed very serious crimes, are actually still around. They're still walking around today. Um, do you think that's, you think something, that's that something that we would we should be talking about more justice when we start, start talking about this issue? And like, like was that disappointing, was that disappointing to, to not really have, have any of that discussion take place tonight? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head there because at least twice the Liberals and the Conservatives were saying, you know, this country has this history, you know, 150 years of injustice or it didn't treat Indigenous peoples well. Very much historicizing what happened as if it's just a matter of dealing with some legacy from the past. First of all, they haven't dealt with any of the legacies of their historic genocide, nor was there any acknowledgement by any of the party leaders that Canada is in the middle of an ongoing genocide crisis, an ongoing human rights crisis, and instead really tried to package it as program areas. You know, well, we've got water and infrastructure on reserve. We didn't get it all done, but, you know, we'll do some more work. Instead of saying, oh, wait a second, we've been found guilty of genocide. Th that's a monumental finding to have. And what is that? That encapsulates all of these things. You know, it's, it's the land theft, it's pipelines, it's man camps, it's murdered and missing, it's environmental contamination, over incarceration, foster care, systemic racism, police killings. And you can just see not a single one of them have any comprehension about how to go about acknowledging the crisis that we're in or present a comprehensive plan to get us out of the genocide to give some people some hope that there is a path forward in the future where we're going to transition out of genocide and actually deal with these things instead of in four years time we're going to be talking about whether whoever got elected dealt with water provided a new housing initiative provided education funding but never addressed the underlying root causes and that's a real disservice to native people yeah yeah and, um, and um, you know, we you saw, know, we saw, saw Jagmeet Singh, Singh sort of, sort of brush, brush up against the point, the point. Um, um, you know, drawing this link between the police, the RCMP, RCMP and violence, and violence against, against indigenous people. people. But once, but once again, again, I hate to keep going, going back, back to this. this. It's an issue it's that he's going to continue, continue, continue continually, continually struggle with when, when you know, you know blockades, blockades to pipeline and old growth logging infrastructure being led by indigenous people are being violently disrupted by the RCMP in places where the NDP is in charge, such as BC or as was happening during the NDP's mandate in Alberta. Uh, that's and just that's in contradiction that he's gonna, they're gonna have to, the NDP is gonna have to figure out at some point. Uh, because exactly. while he can say good things about this, they just don't have a ton of credibility. No, exactly. So, you know, the conservatives face that because, you know, whatever Jason Kenney thinks and Doug Ford thinks and Scott Moe and all of those terrible conservative premiers doing terrible things to indigenous peoples and, and, and people across the board, you know, um, Aaron O'Toole wears that 
same with NDP leader Jagmeet Singh. He's wearing, you know, not just what's happening in BC right now, but under the NDP government in Manitoba, they were one of the worst governments ever for Indigenous peoples. They had the highest levels of everything, every kind of violence and racism against Indigenous peoples, murder to missing, kids in care, incarceration, police killings. I mean, they were literally the worst. And so now under a conservative government, hasn't gotten any better. So both of them wear that. And while they try to distinguish themselves, you know, as or not even answer to it, you know, uh, still you've got Jagmeet not responding to, will you shut down the pipeline? He didn't respond in the French language debate. He didn't respond here. He looks uncomfortable and everybody can see it. That's the problem. It's not like we can't see that they're squirming when they're being asked these questions point blank. And to not answer is the answer. Yeah, yeah. It, was it was uncomfortable to watch. To watch. Um, uh, uh, you know, I talked to Martin about the climate the section of the debate. Of the debate. Uh, Pam, Pam, did you have any takeaways from that? that? Um, um, I, I know you heard what we were talking, talking about. about uh, you know, I'll keep repeating it though. It's just I feel I feel very kind of strange watching these debates take place. We all know the level of seriousness of this crisis. I feel like we're having a debate that was supposed to happen in you know the early 90s, uh, and we're really down to the wire. And we're not we're not hearing the real solutions that we actually need to get us out of this crisis. Like, did you did you get that impression as well? What was your impression of the the climate segments? Well, exactly. I mean, I think some good points were made. I mean, Trudeau made some good points about the conservative government sitting there talking about climate change when his own party members don't believe in climate change, when they voted against climate change as a reality. So, you know, although the conservative leader was trying to say, oh, we've got some trust to build. Come on, you passed the resolution. Your party doesn't support you. You've got these ultra far right people who, you know, are super oil and gas and they don't care about the climate. How are they going to get around that? But then you have to look at their plans. It just amazes me that O'Toole thinks it is a successful strategy to stand there like a robot with a frozen smile on his face and actually try to convince us that you can increase oil and gas production and save the planet at the same time. I mean, it, it doesn't, you don't have to be an environmental scientist, you don't have to be a rocket scientist, you don't have to be a PhD or any of those other people that the Green Party were referring to, um, to understand that that simply doesn't make sense and to try to sell that. And then when really pushed on the question about, wait a second, your targets are like way back in the Harper era. What, you know, if you get elected, you would be doing even worse than Trudeau and Trudeau's not on a good trajectory. What, how do you respond to that? And he's basically trying to sell us that, well, we're making targets that we can meet, <laughs> which is like, okay, so you're still not gonna save the planet, but you're gonna set a low bar in the hopes of meeting that. But with his current plan, there is no hopes of meeting that because you know he always said, every time he mentioned climate change, it was like, oh, but jobs, economic recovery. And you know in his platform, he's even more direct and says, you know, we care about climate change, but not on the backs of workers, not on the backs of jobs. So we know that it's that's a big but when we're talking, you know, there, that's a big proviso. So. It, it was disappointing and the Green Party really failed. What is their plan? I, if I hadn't read their platform, I still wouldn't know what their plan is. After, you know, three debates now? Hello, Green Party. This is what kind of the thing they're supposed to, this kind of supposed to be their thing, I'm pretty sure, right? Yeah, <laughs> and, and same with the NDP. They just spent too much time trying to trash Trudeau and not focus on here's what I have to offer that's fundamentally different and here's how you know it'll make an impact. All he did was trash Trudeau. I can read that on Twitter if I want to hear trashing. I want to hear the answers from the people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Pam, I'm pretty surprised that you're not buying uh, Aaron, Aaron O'Toole, O'Toole, nice guy Aaron O'Toole's tack to the center. I really thought that that would be convincing for you. So I'm, this is very shocking to me <laughs> to hear some of this stuff. No, <laughs> <laughs> no it's, 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 you know, we, we have to laugh about it because... But, wow, that was a grueling two hours. It just really like, was. I was I was reminded why I don't normally watch these live. Usually I just wait yeah. to catch the highlights. About 90 yeah. minutes into this, I was starting to feel like my brain was liquefying and, and coming out of my ears. Um, um, <laughs> Pam, thanks so much for joining us on the program today. 
Uh, it's always a real pleasure to talk to you. And um, we're going to be doing plenty more election coverage. We're going to be live on election night. I'm sure we're going to be talking to you then as well. Thanks so much for joining us on our, uh, on our debate breakdown tonight. Great to talk to you. Thanks, guys. All right, Martin. So um, you, I think you had, a, you, had a, you had an irony of the night. You were pointing to me. You had something very ironic that you wanted to point out. Did we go over that already, or did you? I think we did. I think we did, yeah. Just the, I mean, just the fact how, of how Aaron O'Toole has managed to maneuver himself into trying to adopt the Trudeau formula of 2015, yeah. you know? Um, talking out of both sides of his mouth, um, trying to tap okay. into that nice guy, yeah. like dad vibe. I mean, Trudeau had a slightly different vibe back then, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's amazing to me that, that uh, you know, anyone's really buying this. And that's interesting because you, you mentioned that, like, their polling is kind of slowing down. The O'Toole momentum is slowing down a little bit. And I was wondering if at, the be if at the beginning of this debate, because I think, as we pointed out, there's a big part of the conservative constituency that really isn't on board for this tact of the center that has no interest in that. So do you think that the, the discrepancy that we were seeing in the polling was O'Toole peeling off liberal voters? Uh, to to increase to juice his numbers there, I I think he was it was he, from what we saw he was definitely peeling off voters from the center so like middle of the road liberal voters um, and I think what might have happened is seeing the momentum in the polls you know largely manufactured by yeah it's, uh, it's media a media outlets. horse race yeah. thing yeah it's, um, you get how it works I think some people definitely are taking a closer look at him and are now shifting again to the liberals. Um, and we're also, I think, seeing his success, there was an emboldenment of voters swinging even further to the right, to the People's Party of Canada. Yeah. Um, and I think what might happen now is, who knows, like if there is another kind of like uh, bounce back to Trudeau's favor and there's a strong recovery for him, you could see a lot of those uh, People's Party voters, again, I think, shifting back to Aaron O'Toole and you know, because I, I think they do want to see a conservative government. So yeah. um, I think it's, it's, it's quite fluid right now. Um, and I'm curious to see what happens to that spike in, um, in the People's Party support. Yeah, it is interesting. And something that I think kind of alarming, too, that we've seen from our sort of liberal establishment media class, corresponding to this rise in the polls from the People's Party, is this kind of hand-wringing idea of, well, because people support this, there's a constituency out there for this party, so maybe they should be at the debate as well. But I find this kind of a really dangerous way of looking at things, uh, just inclu you know, including this kind of uh, rhetoric into our discourse and normalizing it. It's obviously something that's never, that courtesy is never really extended in the other direction. Precisely. Um, from folks in sort of the, or the centrist liberals that, that feel like uh, we should be including. They, they say things like, oh, they might have noxious beliefs. We might not agree with what they have to say, but you know, we should hear them out. Um, but are you in agreement? No, like, I, I think I think the liberal kind of media class and certainly the liberal party are much more terrified of the left, whether that's in the ND, in the incarnation of the NDP or further to the left uh, than they are of right wing forces and even far right wing forces. I think. Um, um, they both have a great deal more ideological affinity with the right, but they also think that the right, the far right plays to their advantage, that it scares people um, into the arms of the liberals. So, um, of course, they're much more, they're, I think as you pointed out, they're not, people like Andrew pointed are not calling for, um, you know, the media class to give more of a hearing to Marxist, Leninists and Maoists and anarchists. Yeah. That's that's not on the agenda for the media class. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's the, we talk often about how these these solutions that are being bandied around or don't really go far enough to meet uh, these crises. And that's something that I think maybe we should probably explore is encouraging some of these other uh, viewpoints to get out there so we can hear from these uh, parties and hear that there's actually other viewpoints and that the, the you know the NDP isn't the the furthest most radical solution out there. And that would hopefully pull them in a good direction as well. Well, I think that would have a lot of profound benefits. Um, we're going to be joined now by um, the Breach editor, uh, Riley Yesno. Um, she's joining us right now. Riley, do you hear me? Are you with me? I can hear you, yeah. How's it going, Riley? Welcome back. Good, how are you? Yeah. I'm okay. I'm okay. It was it was a long debate, and now it's late, and now it's, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with it. We're, we're getting through it. How did you how did you feel about watching that whole debate? How are you feeling after all that? 
Oh God, I I really agree with what you were saying to Pam about like feeling like your brain is liquefied. Like that is yeah. how like especially coming near the end. Like I was totally tuning out because like I, I, it's a lot of the things that you and Martin and Pam have already talked about of them being like you know so lacking in substance. I felt like you know Aaron O'Toole was like weirdly quiet, um, which was like. Uh, I think a very strategic thing of him being like, oh, you know, you're not that bad. I feel like I got the NDP and the Greens, like, key messaging within the first, like, five minutes of the debate, and then they kind of just repeated the same thing. So, yeah, it was it was a long two hours. <laughs> yes, it was. Um, I wanted to talk about, because, you know, there was a lot of grandstanding on the on the debate stage tonight about Canada's role in promoting human rights and these kinds of things. This is, <laughs> I, saw, I caught that eye roll. Um, this is something I spoke about last time. Like, it... It really is true, and and Blanchette, to his credit, was the only one to point this out uh, as we were talking about uh, last time we spoke about this. Um, while all this grandstanding is going on, and Justin Trudeau and others try to pretend that Canada is like some force for human rights in the world while we're sending military equipment to uh, to Saudi Arabia. Did you have a, a, a similar sort of reaction to that, that conversation as I did? Oh, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, like, what I was really like interested to see what they were going to talk about when they brought up Afghanistan earlier on in the debate. Um, and then, of course, I don't know why I expected that maybe they would get into something uh, about like Canada's role in global imperialism instead of just being like, what's happening in Afghanistan is bad and we're sad that it's happening. And like yeah. maybe we'll, we should get more troops. And like so or, that or what's happening in Afghanistan that. that's bad is a result of this occupation ending and not a result <laughs> of the, the 20 year occupation that took place in the first place. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then like Aaron O'Toole coming in and saying that Canada has always been a global leader against apartheid as if like <laughs> yeah. he didn't answer I a question about it. the yeah. Indian Act like a couple minutes later. Like, you know, like just the dissonance in like the responses they had was it was like outstanding tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, again, pretend, it's a really a whitewashing of history, uh, uh, pretending that Canada has some some force for good in in, uh, in fighting against apartheid. It's a completely ahistorical version of, of what actually happened. Um, uh, I noticed, too, that like LGBTQ issues weren't really uh, brought up much during this debate. It came up a little a little bit. But were you disappointed with the, the conversation that took place around these sort of issues? Yeah, yeah. I mean, at first I was like, I, I was counting like, you know, if they were going to even bring it up at all, like any sort of LGBTQ policy commitment, because they all have sections, the three major parties at least, um, in their platform about LGBTQ issues. So when they started to bring it up, I was like, oh, okay. And then, of course, it turned into just being like, you know, like, we love gay people. <laughs> it's like a little bit of like the narrative, like, you know, undermining the actual policy commitments that they um, have all made um, or not made, you know, we're not going to talk about. And I think that this was a real misstep for, say, uh, the Greens or even the Conservatives to, like, you know, go for, say, Justin Trudeau abandoning the blood ban, um, the only major party to uh, do so. Um, for the Conservatives, there could have been a real uh, dig at them about the way that they left trans and gender diverse people out of their LGBTQ commitments. And so there also could have been points to, you know, discredit this, like, claim to love these communities and support of these communities. But it, I think also just shows how inadequate a lot of the party leaders have of just a base knowledge of these issues in their own platform. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one thing we've talked about repeatedly tonight now, uh, especially, especially focusing on the NDP, um, is just the, the sort of lack of real solutions or the lack of like the, going far enough, the lack of like radicalism in their, in their proposals to confront these serious crises that we're all dealing with. Um, how did you feel overall that they were able to like get across this program to people watching? Um, and did you think that, you know, like we've mentioned many times, like we were dealing with so many different, very serious crises in this country. Um, do you think the NDP in their platform is going far enough to address these crises in housing and the climate? Uh, and do you think they were able to get this across tonight? Or would, would you call that, would, would that be a miss for you? Um, for me, it would be a miss. I think that the NDP went and like, I, when I was saying like, I identified their key messaging, I thought it was very clear that it was like, you have another option, which, you know, Jagmeet Singh mentioned time and time again during the, the, the debate. 
But then if you're going to give an op- other option, I think it's especially key then that you really spell out, you know, what that option is, what you're offering in uh, in comparison to uh, the Liberals or the Conservatives, say. And I think he really failed to do that, you know, like when we're talking about housing was a huge point um, where I think they, you know, by far have the strongest housing platform, could have pointed out once again um, that there's, you know, not just housing affordability, but homelessness, uh, housing in Indigenous communities and on reserve that nobody talked about, that the Conservatives don't even have anything for housing in their platform for Indigenous people other than addiction treatment. Um, So, you know, there is a real opportunity there, again, specifically for the NDP to talk about um, you know, where they excel, where the other parties lack. And Jagmeet Singh was kind of just like, you know, uh, we're not either of them and we're here and you can vote for us, which is like, yeah, true, you know, but <laughs> it doesn't do much, I think. Yeah, I-, I would love for the NDP or anyone else in our political class to talk about maybe like a housing first policy um, of just like mm-hmm. eliminating homelessness entirely. You'd think with the yeah. scale of crisis that we're dealing with, that would be a solution that could be proposed at least that we could uh, debate about. Um, but we just end up getting these conversations about, about you know, affordability. I'm going to build X number of affordable housing. I'm going to build X number. That's never totally defined about what affordable means. As it was pointed out on the debate stage, it means different things to different people. This was never really articulated. And, and again, it's just one of these other issues where, where I don't think these conversations are being treated with the seriousness that, that it really should be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the NDP have in their platform, again, like really good things. I think it kind of echoes what Mar- the point Martin was making about their climate change and how they actually, their climate change platforms and how they actually have some, you know, good points in their, in their platform about those things. And he just didn't bring them up. Like, you know, they're one of the only parties other than I think the Greens that talk about um, uh, co-ops and social housing and, and non-profit housing projects. And, and just none of that was brought forward. Yeah. Yeah, it's frustrating because, you know, when you look into to different countries around the world that have, that have gone forward with this kind of housing first policy, you realize that it's actually a money saver in many cases, that we're actually spending more money to uh, continue our, our current situation as it is. We're using the police to basically uh, confront this crisis in, in, in uh, unhoused communities uh, rather than just like putting people in housing. Uh, it's a really simple solution. It costs actually less, uh, but you realize that, that in, our, in our culture, uh, we'd actually prefer to uh, to pay more overall uh, to deal with things much more violently rather than just put, putting people in housing. It's such a simple solution. And I would just, I, as you pointed out, there's many good things in the NDP platform, but I would love for someone to articulate this basic idea that the first step is just putting people into housing that need it. You know, it's a pretty, it's a pretty easy answer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, Ronald, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, do you have any final thoughts? Uh, are you ready for this election? Are you worried? Are you, how do you feel? How, do you, how are you feeling now after this debate? We're getting we're getting down to the wire here, Riley. What do you think? What do you think about this election? Oh gosh, I mean, I, I, this election has feel, felt like it's been like you know, like I'm like, how has this all happened in this amount of time? And then also that it's been like just ten thousand years already. Um, I don't know how election 44 has managed to do this, uh, but it has to me. And I, uh, I don't think that, uh, I don't think that there's been enough time for this. I think that, you know, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm ready for the 20th to come and be over, but I do think that I wish we had more time to really engage in these issues and have, um, an election uh, that takes, you know, these really crucial matters way more seriously than we have. Yes. And it's funny as well, because it's been a couple of weeks now. Justin Trudeau still doesn't have quite an actual answer as to why we're having this election. Maybe by yeah. the time we get to the 20th, they'll figure something out that actually explains <laughs> what we're doing here. But you know, I'm not going to hold my breath. Uh, Riley, thanks so much for joining the show. It's great to talk to you again. Uh, I'll talk to you on election night itself. We're going to cover the election. We're going to be in for the long haul. On the 20th, I'm looking forward to uh, to hanging out with you and breaking all that down with you uh, in a couple weeks. Yes, see you in Montreal. Yeah, all right. Great to talk to you, Riley. Take care. All right, Martin. So I guess that's like we're getting to the end of our, of our inaugural live broadcast here. Uh, and I just posed this question to Riley. I'm interested in your take as well. Like, what's... Are you ready for this election? Like, where, how are you feeling? Uh, how are you feeling now uh, after the we put this debate in the rearview mirror? Um, we're close to this election. What are, your, what are your kind of final thoughts as we head into this thing? I mean, one of my, I guess, more pessimistic or realistic thoughts is that um, I think 
the shape and 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 direction of the election and, and really of the, de the election debate tonight is an indication of just how weak the organized left is in this country. Um, I think um, like that is the big reason why we're not hearing answers that um, that reflect and tune in to people's like appetite for bold politics and people's hunger for transformation. Um, yeah. There, we're not really hearing that from certainly the leaders of the political parties and not the leader of the NDP. Um, I guess what I'm. But if they were feeling that pressure from the ground up, maybe they'd be more inclined to provide us with actual, real, actual answers to some of these questions. Right? Yeah, I think there's a very different um, debate uh, being had in many individual campaigns across the country. Like, there's a whole host of. Um, of you know, eco-socialist and left-wing candidates, primarily with the NDP, people like Matthew Green, people like Avi Lewis, people like Leah Gazan, um, who are you know, if they win, I think could um, could really make a difference in uh, in Parliament. So in the last week and a half of the election, um, that's where I'm finding my hope um, in the momentum and upswing of a lot of these campaigns, who who you know have a real chance at either becoming MPs again or winning uh, their seats for the first time. Um, I, I expect that in the next like week or so, the Liberals are going to dial it up to 11 when it comes to screaming bloody murder about uh, the prospect of the Conservatives winning. Yes. Uh, we're going to get uh, treated to their pretty typical moral blackmail, um, <laughs> the kind of strategic vote argument. Sure, which worked really well in the last election. I mean, it worked really well. Probably a primary reason that we saw the NDP kind of disappoint in the last election. Yeah, right? the NDP in the last election had more moment momentum than they have now, and the Liberals just poured huge sums of money into strategic voting ads uh, on social media platforms, on TV, and it really uh, kneecapped the momentum that the NDP had. I think they're still going to do it this time, even though um, there actually is a, a greater threat from the right wing this time around. Um, it works really well for them. Um, but I mean, the thing to keep in mind for progressive and left-wing Canadians uh, and people across this country is that um, literally Trudeau had no reason to call this election other than the fact that he wanted a majority yeah. because the little pressure I think that the NDP was putting on him was even too much for him. Um, yeah, it seems and, like it. And he wants... Um, he wants no pressure from them whatsoever. Yeah. Um, well, that's the frustrating thing. He just still doesn't have an answer about this. And he can talk about all these good things that he wants to do, like uh, like universal child care and these positive things. But these are all things that were possible to do in the current minority government. He could have very well easily worked with the NDP on these kinds of things. Um, and this idea that like we need to have an election in order for it to happen. I mean, again, it's like, I don't know how they expect anyone to believe this, but uh, it's pretty amazing. No, no, it's almost as if they came up with the plan just so they could hang it over the head of the NDP. Um, yes. And claim that, you know, if the Liberals don't get voted into power and it's the NDP who undermines them, then they're to blame for no child care. Um, yes. And no possibility of dental care. Uh, and no possibility of pharmacare. Sure. Um, so, yeah, I, I, they're going to go into full like political moral blackmail mode in the next year and next week and I think people should be ready for that at the doorstep if they're working on campaigns um, and kind of in the air war as well um, and that's I think the bet the best hope still in this situation in, in this scenario is that the liberals are um, maintained as a minority and the NDP if anything enlarge their um, base of progressive and left-wing MPs um, and I think if that happens, then um, for you know those who have a progressive vision for this country, this election will not have been for naught, um, but it will actually put us on better footing to yeah. fight for those things in the coming years. Yeah, and you mentioned these conversations about moral blackmail and strategic voting. It's almost like one of these parties one day should like, campaign perhaps on some kind of electoral reform. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> that would be interesting, and then we wouldn't have to have these kind of discussion, endless discussions at each election. Um, well, Martin, it's been great to break this stuff down with you. Um, I'm looking forward to the election night itself. It should be a, it's going to be a long haul, but uh, it'll be fun to uh, break things down here at the Breach Studios in Montreal. Uh, that's going to conclude our live broadcast. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed it. Uh, it was kind of an inaugural thing. There was maybe some technical mistakes. Yeah, technical. This will this be some no audio problem. problems. Happens. We'll work it out for next time. No big deal. It's okay. But once again, everyone, if you want to catch our election coverage, make sure you subscribe to the Breach YouTube page. We're going to be live on election night. 
Uh, once again, I'm Rob Rousseau. It's been a pleasure to uh, speak with you this evening. I'm here with Martin Lukacs, and uh, we'll, we'll speak to you next time.